Once you've sent your application to a law firm and they've liked the look of it, you'll move on to the next hurdle in the application process, which tends to be some sort of online test. The most common test that law firms use is the Watson Glazer test. And while law firms seem to love it, a lot of applicants just hate it. In this video, I'm gonna go over how I would suggest approaching the Watson Glazer test to give yourself the best chance of getting past this frustrating step of the application process. For those of you who don't know, the Watson Glazer test is uh, an online test that lasts around 30 to 40 minutes. And it's a test of your critical thinking, which means whether you can rationally and logically deal with the information that's given to you. And all of the questions in the test fall into one of five categories. Inferences, recognizing assumptions, deduction, interpretation, and evaluating arguments. Now there's no secret trick to passing the Watson Glazer test, but I think the key is to really understand the differences between what these five categories mean. When you do the test itself, it will give you a little explanation for each of these categories before you start on that section. But I think it's much more useful to have an understanding before you've even started the test at all. What I'd suggest is for you to come up with your own explanations using diagrams, examples, your own words, just to make sure that you know what each section of this test really means. And then after that, make sure that you've got your little sections written on a piece of paper, either printed out or handwritten, whatever you prefer, and have that at hand when you're doing the test itself. Before you start on each section, you can just look at your cheat sheet, look at that relevant section, and that will just get your brain ready to answer those specific types of questions. As well as that, what I used to do on the test is that whenever I was stuck on a question, I would then come back to my little cheat sheet, read the explanation, and that would help me clarify the right answer, or at least rule out a couple of wrong ones. So as I said, I think understanding each section is key. And it's important that you use your own words or do whatever works for you because we all learn in different ways. But just so you can see what sort of thing I mean by this, I'm gonna go through each section of the test and show you how I would explain it. So first off, we've got inferences. The definition given in the test for inferences is a conclusion a person can draw from certain observed or supposed facts. So while I'm sure this is correct, I wouldn't find it particularly easy to understand or helpful when it comes to actually answering the questions. So to improve on this, it would be useful to know what a question might actually ask. So let's look at an example question. So in these questions, you'll get a statement and then a conclusion. So the statement might be, 200 students attended a recent weekend student conference in London. At this conference, the topic of race equality was discussed, since this was the problem the students selected as being most vital in today's world. The conclusion might be, the students discussed mainly industrial relations problems. What's important in the questions in this section is that you have to accept what's given in that statement as being a true fact. Then you're also given a conclusion as we saw in the example above, and you have to say how likely that conclusion is to be true, assuming that the facts given in that first statement are all true. You're also allowed to rely on any common knowledge when going through this inferences section. Another thing that I think makes inferences one of the hardest bits of the Watson Glazer test is that you've got five possible answers that you can pick from. Anyway, this is how I'd approach this question. First of all, I would reaffirm the truth. And by that, I mean, I would go over the facts again and make sure that I've accepted that these are true because that's part of this sort of question. So I'd start to read the statement again, but I'd put the words, it is true that before each section. So for the example one we've given, I'd read it as, it is true that 200 students attended a recent weekend student conference in London. It is true that at this conference, the topic of race equality was discussed. And it is true that this was a problem the students selected as being most vital in today's world. The reason for this is that you have to assume that all this stuff in this statement is true. And going through this process of reaffirming the truth to yourself will just make sure that you've got it solidly in your mind and you're not gonna forget that these are facts that you have to accept before you answer that next section. The second step is to actually try and figure out whether you think this conclusion is true or false. And as I said, you've got five options, which makes it a little bit difficult. But the way I'd go about it is this. First, ask yourself, is this conclusion true beyond a reasonable doubt? So it might not be certain, but it's pretty clear that it follows from the statement. If it does, then you, you can just answer true. It's, you've got the answer there. If it's not true, then you can ask yourself, does this conclusion misinterpret or completely go against the facts? If it does, then the answer is false. If it's neither true or false, you can ask yourself, is it literally impossible to tell either way whether this conclusion follows from the statements above? If that's a position you're in, you can choose insufficient data. So by going through that process, you can either find the answer or rule out three of the possible five options. At that stage, if it's none of the ones we already mentioned, then hopefully you can figure out if it's probably true or probably false just by looking at it and making a decision. So let's look at the example again. 
First of all, we have to reaffirm the truth, but let's just say we've already done that. Second of all, we wanna look at the conclusion and see if it follows. We know that at this conference, the topic of race equality was discussed because that's what it says in the statement. And the conclusion here says that the students discussed mainly industrial relations problems. So you can see clearly here that it just goes against the facts that you're given in the statement. So this one is false. Another conclusion could be some students felt it worthwhile to discuss problems of race equality. Again, when we went through the statement and reaffirmed the truth, we read that it is true that the students selected race equality as one of the most vital problems in today's world. So it does follow beyond a reasonable doubt that some students thought that race equality was important as a topic. So for this second conclusion, you can answer true. Next up, you've got the category of recognizing assumptions. This is where you have to spot whether an argument has an assumption in it. An assumption is something that someone has considered to be true, but might not necessarily be true. So for example, if I'm saying, I'm going to go to the shop tomorrow to buy a cake, I'm making a few assumptions there. I'm assuming that the shop will be open tomorrow, that there will be cake in stock, that I'll have a way of getting to the shop. These are all things that I've assumed when I've made that first statement, but they might not necessarily be true. In these questions, you're given a statement and then you're given something that could be an assumption and could not, and you just have to pick whether it was or wasn't. So for example, a statement could be, we need to save time in getting there, so we'd better go by plane. And the proposed assumption could be that going by plane will take less time than going by some other means of transportation. So for these questions, I always think it's best to imagine two people having a discussion. Maybe it's you and a family member or a friend who you love to argue with. And that last bit's really important. Imagine they said that first statement out loud to you and you just wanna prove them wrong and win the argument because that's just the sort of person you are. So then you turn to them and you go, yeah, but you've assumed that. And then you read that proposed assumption and then have a look to see if that would win you the argument or not. So let's have a look at the example again. Imagine you're going on a trip with your friend and then your friend says, we need to save time in getting there, so we'd better go by plane. Then you want to just prove your friend wrong, so you say to your friend, yeah, but you've assumed that going by plane will take less time than going by some other means of transportation. So maybe, for example, you know it's quicker to go by car or quicker to go by train in this case. So here you can see that you would have won that argument because your friend has actually assumed that going by plane is quickest. So you can then choose that assumption has been made in that case. Another example could be that same statement, but then the proposed assumption is that travel by plane is more enjoyable than travel by train. So if we just go through that same process, your friend will have said to you, we need to save time in getting there, so we'd better go by plane. And then you, in trying to prove them wrong, you said, yeah, but you've assumed that travel by plane is more enjoyable than travel by train. You can see in that case, you wouldn't have won that argument because your friend hasn't actually said anything about which one's more enjoyable. They've just spoken about which one's quickest. So because you would have lost the argument in that case, you know that the assumption was not made. The third category in the Watson Glazer test is deduction. Here you're given a few statements and then a conclusion and you just have to choose whether the conclusion is necessarily true if the statements given above are all true. So again, this one's easier to understand with an example. The statement could say, some Sundays are rainy and all rainy days are boring. And the conclusion could be, some Sundays are boring. So the first thing I do is similar to what we did with inferences before. You need to make sure that you've understood that everything in this statement has to be taken as true. And then you need to check whether that conclusion follows a statement given that everything in that statement is true. So I'd reframe the question by saying, if it is true that, then reading the statement, then it is true that, then reading the conclusion. So in this case, I'd reframe the question like this. If it is true that some Sundays are rainy and all rainy days are boring, then it is true that some Sundays are boring. Once you've reframed the question like this, personally, I'd find it a bit easier to understand whether the conclusion follows or not. Another really useful thing that you can do in these sorts of questions is to use diagrams. This will help to understand what the statement is saying and to find out whether the conclusion follows or not. So in this case, it says that some Sundays are rainy. So you could draw a diagram representing a couple of weeks and then indicate that one Sunday is rainy and one Sunday is not, because it's only said that some Sundays are rainy. Then we're told that all rainy days are boring. So one of our Sundays is rainy, we can indicate that that one is boring, but the other one is not rainy, it's clear, so we can leave it uncertain whether it's boring or not, because we don't know. The conclusion said that some Sundays are boring. And now you can see from your diagram that that is true. Some Sundays will be 
classified as boring if we follow every rule that we're given in that statement. So that's a good way of how you can use diagrams to help you with these uh, deduction questions. Another thing that you can do in these deduction questions is to try and come up with a counterexample that kind of disproves a conclusion and then you can know that it doesn't follow. So imagine we had the same statement, but the conclusion was no clear days are boring. So if you can, based on the rules given in the statement, come up with a counterexample to this, basically showing that there is a clear day that might be boring, you know that this conclusion doesn't follow. So that's another good way of getting through these deduction questions. Next up, you've got the interpretation section. You get given a short paragraph where you have to assume everything told to you is true. And then you have a conclusion stated and you have to say whether that conclusion follows the statement in the paragraph beyond a reasonable doubt. So it doesn't have to be certain, but it's pretty clear that it follows. And also remember in this section, you can only use the information given to you in the paragraph. So the first thing you should do is forget everything you know, just imagine your brain's wiped clean and the only things you know are the stuff given in that first paragraph. Then you have to ask yourself from the content given in that paragraph, does this conclusion follow beyond a reasonable doubt? So again, it doesn't have to be 100% certain, but it's pretty obvious that it does follow. So let's have a look at an example. The statement might be, a study of vocabulary growth in children from ages eight months to six years old shows that the size of spoken vocabulary increases from zero words at age eight months to 2,562 words at age six years. And the proposed conclusion might be that none of the children in this study had learned to talk by the age of six months. So remember, forget everything you know. I don't know anything about when children learn to talk anyway, but imagine you do. Ignore all that information and the only information you have is the stuff that's in the statement given. Then basically you just have to see whether you think that conclusion follows beyond a reasonable doubt based on the information in that statement. So here we're told that none of the children in this study had learned to talk by the age of six months. And the statement has said that the children had a vocabulary of zero words at eight months. So if they had a vocabulary of zero words at eight months, it seems quite clear that at six months, which will be two months before that, they probably also didn't know how to talk. So here you can say that it does follow. Another conclusion might be vocabulary growth is slowest during the period when children are learning to walk. Now, whether you know anything about when children learn to talk or walk or whatever, just imagine you know none of that and the only information you have is what's given in this paragraph. Here, it doesn't tell you anything about when children start to walk and what the vocabulary growth is at that stage. So here you would choose that it doesn't follow because you can't make an argument that it does follow beyond a reasonable doubt. The last section of the Watson Glazer test is called evaluating arguments. In these questions, you're given a statement in the form of a question and then a proposed argument that answers that question and gives a reason for that answer. So for example, a statement might be, should all young adults in the United Kingdom go on to higher education at university? And the proposed argument could be, yes, university provides an opportunity for them to wear university scarves. So in these questions, you have to choose whether the argument is strong or weak. And in a strong argument, you're looking for two things. You're looking to see whether the argument is related to the question, and secondly, whether it is important. So first you have to ask yourself, is this argument related to the question? So is it actually relevant or answering what that question is asking? And secondly, you have to ask yourself, is this important? So is it actually materially impactful or answering the main bit of the question? It's not just talking about some minor thing that isn't really going to the heart of the issue. So if your answer to both of these is yes, so first of all, it is related to the question, and secondly, it's important, then you've got a strong answer. So if you look back at the example, you can see that the argument that's been proposed is actually relevant to the question because it is talking about going to university. So it's not just completely irrelevant to the question. So it does take that first box. But is it important? Here, the question is about whether students should go to university. And the important factors might be whether students will benefit from that education, whether there's some sort of um, social development that we will be able to do there or some extracurricular stuff that's really important. But this answer is talking about wearing scarves. So that's probably not gonna be considered an important part of the question so this will be a weak uh, argument we could have a think about another proposed argument this one could say no a large percentage of young adults do not have enough ability or interest to derive any benefit from university training here the argument is related to the question because it's talking about university and it is relevant and secondly it is quite important it's talking about students interests and ability to get the benefit out of going to university 
So this second one ticks both those boxes and would be considered a strong argument. One thing to note about this section is that you need to ignore your own views on anything. You're just assessing whether an argument is strong or weak. And that doesn't mean you agree with it or you disagree with it. So forget about your own views on things because there could be a strong argument that argues well against a view that you hold very close to your heart, but you still need to be able to spot that so you can just get the points on the test. So now we've gone through all five stages of the Watson Glazer test. As I said before, the important thing to do at this stage is to figure out explanations, diagrams, examples, whatever works for you to really help understand each section and get these down on one piece of A4 paper so you can have that with you during the test. In fact, I've still got the cheat sheet that I made for myself for my Watson Glazer test when I was doing them a couple years ago, um, which kind of goes through each of the sections and then uh, kind of simplifies them and puts them into my own words so I could understand what was going on for each bit. I've got this saved as a PDF if anyone's interested, so you can just message me on uh, Instagram or, or leave your email address in the comments below and I'll send that to you. Also, a big part of the Watson Glazer test is practice and just feeling comfortable with it. As well as that, doing practice tests will let you test your cheat sheet. So once you've made that little cheat sheet, you can do a few practice tests and see whether it works, whether you're getting the answers right. And if you're not, you can make improvements to it there. So I've left a few links to some practice tests in the description box too. So that brings us to the end of this video on the Watson Glazer test. So I hope you found this video useful. Let me know what you thought by leaving a thumbs up or a thumbs down or a comment down below. If you're doing applications right now, consider subscribing to the channel because I'm going to keep on putting application related content out. I've got an Instagram page too where I post updates and get video ideas from people who message me. So if you've got an idea for a video that I've not covered yet, make sure you follow me there too. Anyway, I hope this helps you out and I'll catch you next time.